roll it. The 40th President of the United States, when historians write about the Reagan administration, what do you want them to say? <laughs> you know, I, I've been asked that, and uh, I guess I have to say I've never thought that far ahead. I'm so busy thinking about what we want to accomplish. Uh, I guess maybe just that uh, I help perpetuate this great American dream. What do you hope for in the next three years? There are so many things. Uh, I would like to get us definitely on the pattern of reducing the deficit so that the balanced budget is in view. I would like to then have then going into effect at that time a balanced budget amendment so we could never again go a half a century as we have of regularly uh, deficit uh, spending mm -hmm. each year. and. Um, I would like to see us also uh, uh, have some plan for beginning installments to start reducing the national debt, as we mm -hmm. have done many times in the past. There are a number of things that uh, I would like to see uh, resolve the problem of uh, prayer in schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, have us on the road a good solid road that would could make us optimistic about the chances for peace. On the budget deficit, it seems as if members of your own party are not totally in accord with you. The Congress hasn't supported you. Are you optimistic? David Stockman said maybe this is the last chance, but you're optimistic <laughs> about the future. Yes, I am. Uh, there's no way that anyone could ever uh, balance the budget in one year. This This budget over the years has been structurally built in to our budgeting process. And the difficulty, of course, is getting agreement, not on the need to, to reduce it. Everyone seems to agree on that. But then trying to get them to agree on, well, where do you apply the, the tourniquet and shut off that uh, hemorrhage of, of funds. But I think that we're on the beginning of a track where we can see a progression mm -hmm. of reducing the deficit as a percentage of gross national product. Uh, you know, when you, if you just count the deficit in dollars, and it looks so horrifying, and you say, how did this ever happen? Well, if you look at it back over these 50 years of deficit spending on the basis of what it is as a percentage of gross national product, mm -hmm. that too has been growing bigger. So it isn't as far out of line. Uh, with mm -hmm. past deficits. Some of them were uh, just about as big as this one is in that percentage. But if we can get on a percentage to where for these next three years, what we have have in mind is if we can get it next year down to 4% of the gross mm -hmm. national product, 3% the following year, 2% the next year, we think that that progression will point us to, by 1990, a balanced budget and then you could have go into effect the balanced budget amendment. I spoke to an influential uh, Republican senator on Sunday who felt that possibly the tax reform measure might be diverting attention away from deficit reduction. Uh, do you see that as a complement to it or possibly a stimulant for it? Uh, actually a stimulant for it mm -hmm. in a way because if you look back, not just in our administration, what we did in 1981 when we implemented or began implementing our tax cuts, but go back to uh, President Kennedy's uh, mm -hmm. across the board tax cut, before that to President Coolidge and the tax cuts that he implemented, every instance, the economic growth has resulted in the government getting more revenues at the lower rates mm -hmm. than it was getting at the higher rates. So. I think this tax reform very definitely would help. We're not, it isn't aimed at being a part of that, but it would help in that it would stimulate economic growth and I think would actually uh, thus uh, result in, uh, in increased revenues. This has been spoken of as a pro-family tax measure. H how will that help the families in your estimation? Well, let's start right off with someone down there at the lower end of the earning scale. One of the features of this is that the personal exemption uh, 
-hmm. is increased to, to four thousand dollars and then the deduction for dependents is almost doubled to two thousand dollars a piece instead of the present one thousand and forty so you take a family of four you've got eight thousand dollars of non-taxable income to begin with right there and that plus the reduced rates mm -hmm. we we believe that and first of all uh, so many of our people uh, can't and don't take advantage of many of the loopholes that others have been able to use to reduce their fair share of the tax burden so it is very definitely aimed at families and that was sort of proven the other day when the uh, democratic majority in the House of Representatives, so I'm not just citing a Republican measure, in the Committee on uh, Children, Youth, and Family, have made a study of this tax proposal plus all the others that are before the Congress and said flatly this one is the most pro-family of all of the tax proposals. Is the $2,000 personal exemption, independence exemption, is that a non-negotiable feature? Would you veto a bill if that didn't have that in it? I think it just has to have it, and let me give you my thinking on that. Some years ago, as you know, that deduction was uh, $600. Mm -hmm. And then inflation took hold and has kept coming on. And finally, someone got around to increasing the 600 to 1,040. But right now, actually, if we had kept up with inflation, the deduction should be $2,700. Now, we couldn't remain uh, revenue neutral and go that high, but going to $2,000 is eminently justified simply on the matter of that actually in purchasing power that's smaller than the $600 was back in 1948. There's no lobby for it though among the people, the vast numbers will help, so w w will you in a sense be their champion and, and go to the mat on that, on uh, that issue? Yes, and uh, I have to say though that I, I haven't heard uh, hear from Democrats or Republicans any objection to those mm -hmm. to those figures. Uh, there have been uh, some of the loopholes or deductions and other areas that people have thought should be retained and there's been argument about that but I haven't heard anyone raise a complaint about these personal exemptions. One uh, oblique question. I have read that the reason that you and Franklin Roosevelt were so tremendously popular is because you gave the American people hope. Looking down the road, what cause do you have for hope? Well, I'm an eternal optimist, <laughs> I know, but uh, I can't help but have hope. Just a few years ago, we were seeing uh, our streets uh, torn up with uh, rioting and demonstrations of various kinds. But we also were seeing a, a lack of hope. We were hearing talk about uh, that um, we were no longer a nation of growth and so forth, that we must uh, uh, begin to limit ourselves in our expectations. And our government itself was telling that to the people. And here today, in these few short years, double-digit inflation is down to less than 4% and still on its way down. Uh, interest rates that the prime rate had reached 21 and a half percent and it is down to less or less than a half of that now and still I believe they're going down in the last 33 months we have created 8 million new jobs mm -hmm. and today you know what is referred to as the employment pool is everyone in the United States male and female between the age of 16 and 65 are known as the potential labor pool. That if all of them sought work, that would be, they're all employable. The highest percentage of that labor pool uh, is employed now than has ever been employed before in our history. And the growth in the recovery has been the greatest that we've known in any recovery from any previous recession or depression. But even more than that, there is something out there when you get out on the road and talk to the people. There is a spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, our young people who once were, as you know, uh, totally disillusioned with government and so forth over the Vietnam War, the resurgence of patriotism among them. And now with our volunteer military, no longer having to have a draft, 
I don't know of anything I'm more proud of than our young men and women in uniform and their spirit. I ask you a question for the women viewers in our audience. You've just gone through a very critical medical problem and we know how close you and your wife Nancy are. It's almost a fable love affair better than Hollywood could do it. What was her reaction? How did she handle this, this crisis? Well, she is very courageous and once upon a time, when I was younger, she was, um, uh, she was one of those, uh, uh, what did they call them, those uh, nurses' aides mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, particularly during wartime and all. Uh, so that part, uh, she, was, she was on the job, but she also is a very great worrier. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me put it this way, I've recovered quicker than she did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a terrible crisis. This is the second one. Some of your very close friends from California have gone back into private uh, enterprise or gone back home. Uh, are you turning more to, to your wife for, for counsel? She's a very wise lady. Oh, we've, listen, we've always uh, talked over <laughs> everything together. We, uh, I couldn't imagine it being otherwise. But um, as to the people leaving the administration, uh, I've expected that. I had eight years' experience in California, mm -hmm. and I made it plain from the beginning that these people, I would take them, even if it was only for a year or two years, and then find someone else if they, and when they had to return to their own mm -hmm. careers. And I think it should be that way if you're going to get, well, I always put it this way, I wanted people in government that didn't really want a job in government, <laughs> but that were willing to come and serve uh, rather than those who are seeking government jobs. And the result is you know that they will have to go back to their own careers uh, sooner or later. But uh, no, Nancy and I, have, uh, we don't have any secrets from each other. <laughs> <laughs> we were very heartened to learn that Reverend Muir had been released from Lebanon and word reached us that a, a member of the White House staff was dispatched on Sunday, I believe, to Iran to seek the release of the remaining six, and actually it was seven at that time. Are they, is any word on that that might give hope to us? Well, I can't really talk about what we're doing, because I don't want to do anything that will endanger uh, the prospects of the, of the others being freed. I can only say that uh, we have explored every avenue. We've been working for this for all the time since the first one. Uh, uh, Mr. Buckley was, was kidnapped. And I know that some of the families have grown impatient because if they don't see things in the paper, they don't think we're doing anything. But going public and being in the paper is not the way mm -hmm. uh, to get a Reverend Weir back or any of the others. Could we say cautiously optimistic or is there anything that we can say I, I have to remain cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. and again, we are continuing the efforts that, and we've, we've explored and been trying in every avenue that is open to us, but again, it's something I can't talk about mm -hmm. uh, uh, because, uh, as I say, there is a risk cool. in all of this. Go ahead. You're getting ready for the summit. Is the American press and a free press is so important in our nation, but is it from time to time being manipulated by the Soviet Union to sort of stack the deck against you in this summit <laughs> meeting? Well, I did begin to feel there for a while that, um, <laughs> that uh, when the summit started, uh, they'd be rooting for the other side. That uh, <laughs> he was wearing the white hat and I was wearing the black hat. Uh, you know, that's an old Hollywood expression. That I, I, oh, you yeah. identified the villains uh, by the color of the hat. Um, I, I think what is, should be better understood by our people, and there isn't any criticism of our press, the Soviet Union as a worldwide disinformation network. And it's very effective. And they can get many things uh, published and broadcast and so forth uh, to suit their ends and uh, in their drives, for example, to uh, try to create some friction among our, us and our allies. And uh, I don't think we have anything comparable uh, to that. One last question. I see their time has run out. Uh, if Congress gives you a trade protectionist bill having either a tariff or a surcharge or some other name, will you veto it? I will have to. Uh, that's one of the advantages of being my age. 
I was looking for work in the Great Depression, and I know what the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Bill did, the trade war, the world trade war that it created. There is no way that that can win. You, uh, a protectionism for, say, a particular industry, no one ever looks over their shoulder to see how many people in other industries lost their jobs because it's a two-way street and retaliation sets in. We are still the greatest exporter in the world. And even though there is a great trade imbalance right now, that we're importing far more than we're exporting, that is not because we have reduced our exports as big as they ever were. We have increased our imports because of the value of our dollar and the fact that our trading partners have not had the economic recovery we've had, so their prices are low, and you can't blame people for picking up a bargain. What they need is a dose of Reaganomics in Europe, is that what you say? Exactly. As a matter of fact, they themselves admit that in their systems there are so many rigidities in labor laws and everything else that have been built in that they have not had the recovery. Indeed, when I was at the recent economic summit, the last summit in May, they, they called to my face, they called what we have is the, the miracle of America. And, uh, well, so uh, we've tried to pass on to them uh, information that we think would help them have some miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Well, God bless you. Well, thank you very much. And in saying that, let me tell you, when you asked about the future and why I was optimistic and all that, I am convinced this is a nation under God. And as long as we recognize that, believe that, uh, I think he'll help us. There's no question about it. That's the greatest cause for optimism I know of. Mm. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Marvelous. You were so gracious. I appreciate it. They, they, they were giving me some time to. I wanted to go longer, but just they said no. God bless you. Can we check payroll? Thank you. jobs in manufacturing, but we have created 9 million new jobs in transportation and service industries. So we have a program for retraining people who are in these wrong kind of industries and <coughs> even relocating them. And this is the best that we can do, but the, it isn't a case of actually losing employment. It's a case that is changing the type of employment. If, if Germany has 12% unemployment, what we're doing here isn't. And England has 13. Yeah. Oops. <laughs>